Good morning, everybody. Please have your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm just going to make a point uh, while standing here behind the Lord's table. We call this the Lord's table, not that there's any significance to the table itself, but this is where we generally talk about the Lord's Supper and the significance of what Jesus did and the significance of this meal. We're going to, to say a thing or two about how we remember at the very end of the sermon, but it's going to take me a while to get there. And sometimes I, I know when it takes a long time to make a point, sometimes it can be difficult to listen to a preacher. So I'm going to make the last point first. This is the entire sermon. This is it. Not everyone who eats covenant meals remember very well. Not everyone who eats a covenant meal remembers very well. Tuck that in the back of your mind. And turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. If you're not there already, we're going to say a few things about the, the exodus and coming to Mount Sinai and a covenant meal that was eat, uh, ate there. God saved Israel with a mighty hand. He bore them on eagle's wings. That's actually God's words in Exodus 19. He told Moses, it's like I put you, Israel, on the back of an eagle. And I took you out of slavery and I'm bringing you here to myself. That we now can enter into a covenant. That we can enter into an agreement, a relationship with each other. And God did that with majestic power. It was such an amazing display of power and what a, what a testimony it would have been. That, that Yahweh is the true God of all the universe, the ten plagues and the Red Sea incident. And what a blessing it was to be an Israelite, that God would choose slaves who were nothing, uh, so insignificant on the world stage. The Egyptians considered them nothing, uh, nothing but a bunch of sheep herders, which they considered to be disgusting and heinous. But it was a tremendous blessing to be chosen. Well, why did God choose such an insignificant, nothing people? Because of His promises. Because He's faithful. He made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that He was going to select their descendants. And regardless of them being slaves or not, He was going to be true to that promise. And you can get a sense of what was going through at least Moses' mind here in the book of Hebrews about how much of a blessing that truly is. He refused, Hebrews chapter 11 will say, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Look at verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He wouldn't call her mommy, and he wouldn't allow her to call him son. I don't know if they had that conversation or not, but the book of Hebrews says he refused. Don't call me part of Pharaoh's family. Well, whose family are you a part of? Verse 25, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of palace life. The book says sin, of course, but palace life. He was a member of the royal family. Verse 26, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. If you won't allow me to call you son, and you won't call me mommy, assuming that I'm Pharaoh's daughter, whose family are you a part of then, Moses? I'm with the Israelites. I'm with the people of God. You mean those dirty, nasty slaves? You mean our free labor down there in Goshen, those sheep herders? Those disgusting people that we use to make bricks with? Yeah, I'm with them. That's my family. Well, you don't want the treasures of Egypt? You don't want the royal palace life? You don't want all the power and the prestige of what it means to be related to the Pharaoh of Egypt? No, I don't want that. I don't want the passing pleasures of, of palace life and sin. I want the life of reproach and mistreatment with the Israelites. Well, why would you want that? The end of verse 26 says, because God has something prepared for us that would blow an Egyptian's mind far beyond palace life and what it means to be part of the Pharaoh's family. And I don't think he's talking about the land of Canaan there. I think he's talking about the promise of a spiritual city. The city that these people in Hebrews chapter 11 sought. 
So what a blessing it was. The ten plagues happen. Pharaoh, after he loses his firstborn, says, get out of here. And so they leave. And the Egyptians were giving them treasures. You remember that? They were giving them wealth and their treasures. And they left Egypt with great riches. And then they, they come to the Red Sea. And Pharaoh finally realizes, okay, well, if I'm not going to get my son back, obviously. And we lost our free labor. What did I do? I made this grave mistake. And so they man the chariots and they start chasing down the Israelites. But they've come to this brick wall, or so they thought, at the Red Sea. And they begin to panic and say, Moses, why did you bring us out here? And, and Moses quietly says, hold on. And then he says, God, do you have a plan? And God says, yes, take your staff. And you remember that incident where God puts that cloud? Before he even parted the Red Sea, he had put that cloud so that the Egyptians couldn't pass through and attack the Israelites. So you have the Red Sea. Imagine this. I didn't put this on the PowerPoint. But you have the Red Sea, you have the Israelites, you have the cloud, and then you have the Egyptians. And then God separates the Red Sea, and they begin to pass through on dry land. And, and as they're about to finish passing through, God lifts that cloud. They send out the war cry. They begin to, to pursue the Israelites through the Red Sea. God has that collapse, and they all die. They all drown. These, this, the, the military of the greatest kingdom of the world. Well, if you're on the other side of the Red Sea, imagine you're an Israelite. And you see all of these broken up chariots in the water. You see these dead bodies washing up on the sand, the shore. What would you be thinking about God at that moment? Wouldn't you be thinking, I am going to serve him with all my heart. I am going to give him everything I've got. He is, Yahweh is the true God. I mean, I'm convinced I'll give him everything. Hang on to that thought. Hang on to that thought. They did have those thoughts, and rightfully so. Moses, in the book of Exodus, begins to sing a song in Exodus 15, and then Miriam, at the end of Exodus 15, begins to lead the women in song. And some of the language of those songs is a language of celebration, and they're giving God credit, and it's awesome. They, they should have felt like that. But then they come to Sinai. And turn in your Bibles, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 5, and look at verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 5 in verse 4. Moses uses a phrase here in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5 and verse 4 to describe the meeting at Mount Sinai. Now remember, they had not received any laws from God up to this time, except from what they were passed down from the patriarchs, of course. We know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they made sacrifices, and perhaps that was passed down, and how to make sacrifices... And they knew Cain and Abel's story, if that was passed down, you can't murder people. And they would have known what God said after the flood, if you murder someone, your blood shall be shed. And they would have known about homosexuality and the abomination that that is from Genesis 19. The patriarchs would have passed that down. But they have no idea, generally speaking, of who God is, how He's to be served, and how to treat their fellow man. But here at Sinai, they're going to, God is going to thunder down with His own voice the Ten Commandments and this, this law system, the Torah, the law of Moses begins to be given there at Mount Sinai. But Moses says this in, in verse 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 5, The Lord spoke to you face to face at the mountain. I love this. I love this, this, this way of how He's describing the Sinai event. Face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire. Well, no man can see God's face and live. Even Moses was told that. When he asked God to see his glory, God told Moses, you can't see my face and live. No man can do that. So I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to cover you there with my hand, and I'm going to pass by, and you're going to see some semblance of my glory. But no one can see my face. And yet, the guy that was told that, Moses is telling them that it was a face-to-face -face meeting, obviously a figure of speech, right? To show that this was as close, as personal of a meeting as it got. Turn in your Bibles now to Exodus chapter 19. And let's look at this incident a little bit more closely. In Exodus chapter 19, do you remember how terribly awesome this event was? Now keep in mind, all of the amazing things that they've seen thus far, right? They've seen the ten plagues. They've seen water from rock in Exodus 17, the crossing at the Red Sea. They've seen manna from heaven. 
these people have seen some amazing, amazing things, and none of those things touch the hem of the garment of what they saw in Exodus 19 there at Mount Sinai. I want you to imagine a forest fire. This is just a depiction of what it would have been like seeing this event. Imagine a forest fire for a moment, but there's no forest. The mountain itself is on fire, and it's billowing black, black smoke. Do you remember the, the last forest fire in California? Where, where cities actually went up in hours. There's a city called Paradise, California that 60 Minutes did a special on that literally went up because of how hot it was in hours. I sold a trailer to a guy who lived in Paradise, California, and he was at my desk, and I, I said, what's your address? And he said, well, I'm gonna have to give you a P.O. box, a mailing address. My house is about this tall. I said, what do you mean? He said, my house is about this tall in ashes. I'm, I'm from Paradise. I said, you're kidding. And he began to talk to me about how hot and amazingly hot that fire was. There was no wood left that was charred black. He said it all crumbled to the ground. Imagine a forest fire, hot, but it's a mountain burning. And imagine that it's completely shaking. A forest fire that's shaking, <laughs> rumbling. And then you have this trumpet blast, but there's no trumpet to be found. It's a heavenly trumpet, an angelic trumpet. And then you have this command to set up a perimeter that nobody's even to touch this mountain. Even if a beast touches the mountain, they'll die. And you remember what the book of Hebrews says about that command? When they heard that command, even if a cow breaks through and touches the mountain, it, it'll, it'll die. They said, when we heard that, we, we couldn't endure it. Imagine how amazingly terrifying this would be. And then God speaks. That's all before God even says something. God answers, what does God's voice sound like? The Bible says it sounds like thunder. Begin reading with me in verse 18 of Exodus 19. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because Yahweh had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln. The whole mountain trembled greatly and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. That's the best interpretation of thunder I've got. God's voice. Wow. Imagine speech that you could hear that sounds like thunder. And of all the amazing things that they saw, it was God's speech that terrified them the most. Because when God speaks, they say, we can't handle that. We'll get to there in just a moment. But do you remember how the Ten Commandments begins? It doesn't begin with a commandment. The Ten Commandments don't begin with a commandment. The Ten Commandments begins with, with, with the way we start any conversation. Hi, my name's Alan. I'm Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's what he says in, in, in chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. God spoke all these words in thunder, saying, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then he begins. It begins with the statement, here's who I am. This is my name. I'm Yahweh, your God, who brought you here. I saved you. I brought you on eagle's wings. Commandment number one, you shall have no other gods besides me. Commandment number two, do not make any carved images. Commandment number three, you shall not take Yahweh's name in vain. Now, I'm going to stop there because those three are going to come back up in just a moment. But when they heard God's speech, God's thunderous voice, they told Moses, stop, you, you, you must stop or we'll die. Beginning now in verse 18 of Exodus 20. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us, we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. They were so frightened hearing God's voice. They say in a different instance, it, when Moses is recounting the event in Deuteronomy, they say, who, who among all the people have heard God's voice and live? We, we cannot endure that. Question, and don't cheat on me. Don't, don't look at the next verse. Do you think that's a positive response or a negative? I'm convinced that modern day Christianity would say, well, the, you, you're not supposed to be scared like that and... We, we try to get fear out of religion. 
Hogwash. No, 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 no. No, fear is good. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the, the book of Proverbs says. And Moses will argue with them for a moment and say, no, 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 this, this is positive. He says in verse 20, do not fear. But then he says, God has done this so that you may fear. <laughs> so what's he saying? Don't fear, but fear God. And I think what Moses is saying is don't, don't fear the mountain. Don't fear the smoke and the trumpet and the fire and the earthquake. Don't, don't fear that. But fearing God is good. And what's the last part of verse 20 say? That you may not sin. Fearing God stops sin. You hear that? That's positive. And people who live lives of sin and without any consequence and... They have zero fear of God in them. Paul says that exact same thing in Romans chapter 3. You know who else thought this was a positive thing? God did. Referencing again Deuteronomy chapter 5, we won't turn over there. But what, when Moses goes back up to God, God says, Moses, do you see how they've responded? Oh, that they would respond like that or take that with them always. Oh, that they would have a heart like that always. And it's like God is saying, I want them to bottle that up and, and take that with them. And I want it to, to go with you too. This isn't the main point of the sermon, but hear me, please. When, you, when I read this, you know, I, I get goosebumps on my arm. The, the hair on my arm stands up and I'm just overwhelmed with the power the majestic power of God. And I don't want that to ever go away. I don't ever want to stop reading Exodus 19 and 20 and, and goosebumps not arise on my arm. And I don't want you to act any different or think any different. God wants you to be overwhelmed. But Moses says, God says through Moses, okay, that's fine. If they want me to speak to you, and then you to them, let's do that. And Moses, from the end of chapter 20 to the end of chapter 23, goes up and receives part of the law. It's like the covenant within the covenant. It's called the book of the covenant. Turn with me now to Exodus 24. Alan, what does this have to do with the Lord's Supper? We're getting there. We're close now. Exodus 24, Moses comes down from the mountain now. Remember, they're just honoring their wishes, okay? They're just honoring the wishes of the people that God speak to Moses and then Moses to the people. And he comes down with part of the covenant. And this is what they say in verse 3. Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice. All the words that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. Look at verse 7. That's a pretty good response, wouldn't you say? Look at verse 7. Then he took the book of the covenant, this small portion that he just received from the end of chapter 20 to, to the end of chapter 23. And they said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient. All right. You're in. They're raising their hand and saying, we, whatever God says, we agree to that. We're in on this agreement. We're in on this covenant. And look at what he does in verse 8. Deuteronomy 24, or Exodus 24, verse 8. Moses took the blood, threw it on the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. We know from our previous studies, covenants were ratified with blood. You're in. You're, you're saying that you agree, okay? All right, here's blood. I'm going to sprinkle it on the book of the covenant. Here's blood. I'm going to sprinkle it on you. And that represents the two parties. God, represented in the book of the covenant, and you, the people, all have blood on you. And now, one of the strangest things happen in all of Scripture 74 people eat a meal with God. Ooh, we're getting there. You just have to read it for yourself. Verse 9. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. What? I thought you said, Alan, earlier in the sermon, no man could see the face of God and live. God said that, actually. 
And here it says that they saw the God of Israel in some shape or form, not him in his fullness, obviously, but they actually see his, his feet, whatever that looks like. Uh, begin reading with me again in verse 10. They saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, the pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. Verse 11. He did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God. There it is again. And they ate and drank. Seventy-four of the leaders of Israel come together with God and they eat a meal. And did you, begin, did you see what the, the beginning part of verse 11 says? He didn't lay his hand on them. Jewish rabbis say what that's talking about is he didn't kill them. Because remember the context. They had set the perimeter around Mount Sinai. And what was the command? If anyone passes through here and touches the mountain, what's going to happen? They'll die. Wait, wait a second. So, so you're telling me that, that if anyone passes through the mountain, they're going to die. But now 74 of them are eating and they have this intimacy. They're in covenant now. They're enjoying this intimacy with God, at least these 74 rulers. And they eat a meal consummating the fact that they are in covenant. Now listen to these things and just hear the New Testament. Ready? You have agreeing parties in a covenant. A sacrifice made. Blood sprinkled. and a meal celebrating the covenant. Hear it again. You have agreeing parties in a covenant. You have a sacrifice made, blood sprinkled, and you have a meal consecrating the covenant. It's not difficult to see the Lord's Supper in what's going on. You say, Alan, you're, you're going too far. Am I? Because guess what? Jesus will use the same phraseology from verse 8. Go back to verse 8. Deut uh, I keep saying Deuteronomy. Exodus 24, verse 8. Moses took the blood, threw it on the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant. Jesus adds two words. My, my blood, and new, new covenant. But other than those two words, that's the exact phraseology that Jesus uses when he institutes the Lord's Supper. Wow. But here's what's so sad. 72 of these rulers, in about a month, will be worshiping a calf. Go to Exodus 32. And here's where we start making application. Exodus 32... So they have this covenant meal, 74 of the leaders, and I'm assuming that Joshua was one of the elders. I'm assuming that when I say 72 of them are worshiping the golden calf, because Moses and Joshua went back up into the mountain, and they were there for 40 days and 40 nights. And while Moses and Joshua are up there receiving the rest of the covenant, because they were only given parts, this is what happened. Beginning in verse 1 of Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said, Up, make for us gods who should go before us. As for this Moses, the man who has brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears and your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. Verse 3. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned with it a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, built an altar before the calf. And this is what he says. And Aaron made a proclamation, last part of verse 5, and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to, the, to Yahweh. Wait a second, Aaron. Who are you calling Yahweh? That's not that calf's name. It is like they are going down the list of Ten Commandments. Break, 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 break. I told you earlier, the Ten Commandments begin not with a commandment, but with a statement. I'm Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And did you notice twice 
they deny that. They first say, Moses did that, and we don't know where he is. And then when the calf is built, they say, oh, the calf did it. Break. Commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Break. And it's like they're on their wedding night. I heard someone describe this incident recently as, as sleeping with somebody else on your wedding night. Can you imagine? That's how new this covenant is. Commandment number two, don't make any carved images. Break. Commandment number three, do not use Yahweh's name in vain. Who did Aaron just call Yahweh? That dumb, mute calf. Wow. And he's one of the guys that was the right-hand man to Moses. He's one of the guys that was at the meal ceremony there in Exodus 24. And when I see that... I think to myself, who am I to think? I'll never give up faith. No, 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 not me. I'll never apostatize. No, 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 never me. Not Alan. No, it's possible. And I'm so glad that I have a covenant meal to remind me every week. Alan, you raised your hand. You raised your hand. And you told God, I'm in. When you were baptized into Christ, Alan, you raised your hand and you said, I'll be obedient. Everything you say, God. I want to be in a relationship. I want to be in covenant. And I'm so glad it's every week. I'm so glad that we do this just the way the disciples did it in the first century. Because I don't know about you, but I need a weekly reminder. At least that. To get my compass straight. To make sure that I'm thinking straight. And I'm focusing on the things that I need to focus on. But do we remember better than they? Are we more apt to remember than they? I don't know that we are. Now, you, you might say, Alan, this is a golden calf. I mean, none of us would ever do something like that. But we got idols in our hearts, don't we? We're still rending idols from our hearts all the time. And you might be saying, well, Alan, we, we know so much more than they did. Yeah, yeah, we do. We know Jesus, who is the fullness of deity. We know Jesus, who is the exact representation of Yahweh himself. He is Yahweh himself. Our mind could even wrap itself around that. And we know the end of the revelation. We've got the full story. But you know what? While we know more, they saw a lot more. They saw a lot more than I've seen. And here they are, at a month later, doing this. So, take heed, lest you fall. And just realize, this is possible for us. And we need this. We need this reminder. Please get out your songbooks and turn to the song of invitation. I love the 9 a.m. sermon. I, I think I've told you that once or twice before. I just... I love the 9 a.m. sermon. I have never been a part of a congregation that had a sermon prior to the Lord's Supper. In all the congregations I've ever worshipped at, it, the sermon is always the last thing that they do. And then there's an invitation song. And, but, but there's never a sermon prior to the Lord's Supper. Except here. Where we do. And I just think it's such an awesome time to to think about the Lord's Supper in some way, shape, or form from time to time, and just, I hope it helps you think more clearly in about an hour when we take this covenant meal. And I've also said this before, I love the 9 a.m. sermon, because I love the thought that if someone is baptized, if you want to be baptized right now, and you want to enter into covenant, in about an hour, you can join with us, in the covenant meal. What a way to start being a Christian. To be baptized and an hour later 
taking this covenant meal, the most important thing we do all week, right after becoming a Christian. If you need to do that, please come forward as together we stand and